how are you utilizing the extra hours since you decided to quietly quit? I have a recommendation. Use this extra time to find a new job. Because let's be honest, we don't have a challenge dedicating hours to something we're passionate about, something we love. And so if you really loved your job, putting in a little bit of extra time or work wouldn't be considered a burden because we really love what we're doing. Now, I understand this isn't 100% of the cases, but because we now have this extra time off, let's maybe focus a little bit on if you did quietly quit, what are some of the steps we should be taking with those extra hours to find a new position? So let's dive right in. This is a longer video, so please hang out with me. Lots of sections to go through. So item number one is defining it. I actually asked my wife last night, does she know what quiet quitting was? And she said no. And I said, okay, well, maybe if she's not familiar with the term, maybe you aren't either. Quietly quitting is basically, you're just doing your job. You're doing the assigned tasks, you're leaving on time, but you're not working outside of your regular hours. And it's not about slacking off, but you're setting boundaries to not prevent burnout and not taking on any additional work that's basically outside of your scope. So while everyone may not hate their job and still decide to quietly quit, again, I would just challenge, can we find an even better job with this extra time? So let's get into the weeds. Item two is gonna be all about calendaring. And let's assume maybe we were working just an extra five hours a week. So we were working nine hours a day instead of eight hours a day. And that could have been skipping lunch or taking a lunch and working an extra hour. That could have been working from eight to 9 p.m. on a given night just to get all of our admin tasks done. So my strong recommendation initially is maybe we stick to that same calendar. We make no changes to our calendar, but we repurpose this time. And so obviously it's got to align with whatever's best for you, but let's call it four hours a week. Let's get that Friday back and let's just take back that one hour per week for four hours a week and start building that into our calendar so we're getting really efficient with our time if we decide that maybe a job search and finding another job is a good move for us. So we gotta go to item three and start with the resume. I know this is a huge pain point, but I'll put a link in the YouTube description below for a template resume, and I'm gonna be adding in cards and all sorts of templates throughout this video. So as we ease into our job search, week one is really about spending probably those four hours, maybe not that much time, focusing in on three specific items as we update our resume. The summary. The summary section is the most important part of your resume because your audience has limited time. So how do we format that summary section so that it really catches our audience's eyes? And there's two real keys. We use bullets and these bullets never go over one line. Because if, if your audience is looking at a resume that's in paragraph form or long bullets, they're just gonna skip over it and go right into your experience. And typically the average person is viewing your resume for three to five seconds. What are we gonna put in these summary bullets? very specific skills. So no team player, hard worker. We're gonna put very, very legit, very strongly defined skills. And this is just building the summary on our go-to resume. We are going to build new resumes for each job we apply to, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Then, the next step is we just wanna go into our experience. There's two areas I really like to focus in on. We focus in on the responsibilities and accomplishments. And the reason why we focus in on these two areas is oftentimes the advice will be just highlight your accomplishments, but then I don't know what you do in the day to day. And those are gonna be some of the most critical items for our keyword searches. So we really wanna get those items in. And obviously we wanna build in those great accomplishments, bring in some numbers, obviously, if you can. And then lastly, we'll just make sure that our education section is clean and then any technical summary or summary section at the bottom, again, usually aligned with technical skills, sometimes those will be repeated. So those will be up at the very top in our summary section and repeated again in our technical summary. Now item four is our LinkedIn. Let's start with the good news. 
we work on our resumes first so we can repurpose some of these items and some of these items into our LinkedIn profile. Your LinkedIn profile is an online resume, so you'll constantly want to be tweaking and updating it. And since we quietly quit, let's focus in on a few items that we can really work on to help us have success. So it all starts with first impressions. And so when somebody hits your LinkedIn page, before they scroll down, have you created that great first impression? It starts with our background image. And essentially in the background image, you want something that's really visually pleasing, which is gonna be a great start. And then something that's maybe, you're just putting your company logo in there, or you're putting, let's say you're a software engineer, you're just putting lines of code in there. It, gets them visually attracted to your profile. Now you can just go to canva.com to make sure that the, the basically the image size is correct. And just remember, don't have your head block out any words. It looks kind of lazy and it may create the wrong impression. Now the second piece is going to be our headshot. Okay. And what do we know about headshots? This is about the angle you want shoulders and above, and then we're going to be smiling and then you want a clean background. Those three items are gonna be key. The smiling piece is hands down the most important. People are more attracted to those who smile, so make sure you have that item in there. Then we're gonna move on to the headline. And sometimes I see some funky headlines and they're really just strange. If you're a software engineer, just put software engineer in your headline. Again, if you're applying for software engineering roles and you've quietly quit your position, but you're looking for another software engineer role, we're going to want to show that to our audience. So I would say less creativity is better. And then maybe, just maybe, touch base and get some of those admin items right. Make sure your college is aligning right with your highest degree. Make sure your contact info is clean. Make sure your current position is showing up at the top. If that top section is really clean and really good, they are going to continue to scroll down. And this is where we're gonna utilize what we did in our resume. The summary section, you're literally just gonna copy and paste your summary bullets into the summary section on your LinkedIn profile. Remember, they can only see the first three lines without clicking see more. So prioritize your summary bullets to have the top three be the most important. And then same with experience. We're just gonna go ahead and paste that in. It's so simplistic. You sometimes will get guidance not to do that, but remember the way that people find you is keyword searches, so it should mirror your resume. And then of course, you're just gonna to wanna to make sure that the education piece is clean. Just be honest, if you do not complete your degree, just put in the notes, hey, uh, I completed five out of eight semesters, something like that. Just want to be and have that honest approach right off the bat. There are many other sections you can focus in on, but this is our starting point. Again, LinkedIn is going to be a document, well, an online or online document that we continue to edit over time. Maybe give this piece a week too. So now we've done a week on the resume, a week on the LinkedIn. Maybe you don't need four hours per week on each one, but we're just, we're easing into it. So then we go to item five behavioral examples. Okay, so this is going to get a little bit more into our prep plan. So what do we know? We know that the vast majority of companies focus in on behavioral answers. And so we're going to have to just start to build these answers. And for this, I'd like to give it a couple weeks. So let's say again, if we're spending four hours a week, let's say eight hours. So what is our starting foundational point? I love talking about this with clients. It's really basic. We're just going to have our resume open. We started there so we could get everything down. We're going to start to look at our responsibilities and accomplishments. And as we look through these items, we're going to start to assess, okay, what are some examples that I might want to bring up in the interview? And all we're going to do is title them cloud implementation with General Motors, cloud training creation, etc. We're just going to start to think about our best examples and we're going to give them titles. Identify at least five to 10 to start. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that next step. This is what I like to call the what's. So now what we've done is we've titled some of our best examples and now we're going to attach what's to those. And the what's are, well, what did I do? What did I personally do to specifically contribute? And that's it. 
that's your hour. It may take more than an hour, but just identify five to 10 examples and just wrote, write down how you personally contributed. So again, if this takes about an hour, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back to it and the next day we're gonna fill in the hows. So every what needs a how. So typically the what's have, you know, three to four hows. So you did what, and then you did it by doing it how. And the, I know the verbiage is a little tricky, but we're trying to show and demonstrate what we did. Remember, past performance predicts future performance, so the how is very critical. So for your top five or 10, you're gonna be breaking down the hows within the what's. Again, maybe that's another hour, maybe a little longer. Then we can go back and start to build the other parts of our answers using the STAR method. So day three, maybe we start building in the situation and task. You only need to do a few things there. You just need to state your role in company. You want to spend one to two sentences giving that context. So some specificity, but generic enough that any audience would understand. And then we want to outline the task in each of these examples. What were you tasked with doing and what was the timeline? And sometimes it's just like, hey, I needed to get it done. Let me tell you how I did that over the next week, month, quarter, etc. Again, for each one of these situations, let's call that another hour. All of this could be expanded out, right? Each one of these could take two hours, but we're just going to call it an hour. And then lastly, the results. So we start to think, okay, well, what was the biggest result of me taking on this initiative, project, program, etc.? Then we're going to try and embed numbers into our result as much as we possibly can. And then lastly is repeatability. This is my favorite item. How did this initiative project or program contribute to the larger organization specifically what i mean by that is did this add to a larger process a larger strategy build better relationships etc it's a great way to end your answers and as we're thinking about the time convention again a couple weeks on this we're thinking eight hours total however long it takes for you to put together your answers then you're going to take the next step of just practicing out loud in front of a mirror, just stating it out loud, recording yourself, whatever you prefer. And so what's the timing? Your situation and task should be about 30 seconds. Your action should be two to three minutes. And then your result should be about 30 seconds as well. It's a lot of work, but this is a great foundational area because again, companies are gonna lean very behavioral for the most part. So let's flip into item six, the hypothetical prep. And as I was building this script and I script out all my videos just so I make sure I'm touching on everything, this is gonna feel very high level and maybe a little confusing if you've never tried to answer hypothetical questions before. And again, I'm gonna put all sorts of resources in the YouTube description to help you through this. But let's talk about some high level items where you can start to get your prep really aligned. And again, if we're giving two weeks on the behavioral answers, let's give a couple weeks on the hypothetical answers as well. We're not trying to overwhelm here. We're just trying to do about four hours a week. And again, we quietly quit. So we have this time back to put in this work, ideally. So where do we start? Well, we start with our frameworks. And what is a framework? Frameworks are simply ideas or concepts that we want to focus in on when we get hypothetical questions to organize our answers. So there's really two ways you can go about identifying what are some key items that you might introduce in your frameworks. Well, we start really simply with our strengths. What are our greatest strengths? Get those into a Google Doc. This is where we're going to actually start to go online and look at some job descriptions of companies we might be interested in joining, positions we might be interested in. We're gonna to start to look at those job descriptions and say, oh, yeah, I do need to have scalability, or I do need to know how to implement, or I do need to know how to identify risks. And so you're gonna to start to see some of the themes in these keywords as they pop up in job descriptions, and you're gonna to start to write those down on a piece of paper. The frameworks are gonna be really rudimentary to start, but it's giving you a good idea of how you handle items at work, both from a job-focused perspective and strengths-focused perspective. Then we move on to clarifying questions as our prep. Even though typically I would want you to introduce these clarifying questions first in your answers, frameworks establish some key areas for clarifying questions as well, meaning let's go back to that risk term. Maybe 
we think, okay, we need to identify risk in our clarifying questions because we're a program manager for cloud, for example, and risks are going to be a really, really critical item. So start to work through those clarifying questions. Um, each one of these steps, like the frameworks and the clarifying questions, this will probably take an hour or two by each step. And I don't want to put too much of a time convention there, but like, what are the questions you constantly ask when you get in front of an initiative program or project? And then look at the job descriptions and ask, okay, what kinds of questions would I ask in these jobs? Now, this last part of pre-planning is super, super hard. So stick with me pre-planning assumptions. So again, I've been talking a little bit on cloud just because it's easy to focus in on one area. So what are some assumptions that you might make? Like what are the assumptions you might make if you were working with a new client or existing client or working on internal efforts to improve the overall cloud experience, for example? Start to pre-build some assumptions based on these job descriptions of what you might face in these positions. Because if we pre-plan assumptions, what it does is it starts to trigger our brain and remove some anxiety when we get into the interviews to say, okay, what are we gonna talk about? Well, you've thought about those assumptions beforehand and usually we pick assumptions that will cast a wide net. Again, I know this is very, very high level. Then you can use the question bank on our website. Again, I'll put a link to that below. And then you're gonna to start to try and answer those types of questions because we really can't answer open-ended questions without a question put in front of us. And this is where you'll start to build in solutions as well. This is really the second week. You've started to create a foundation on clarifying questions, your frameworks and your assumptions, and then you're gonna to start to really build into those solutions. Again, very, very high level prep to start. So now let's flip over. Let's go to item seven and talk about our practice plan. Now we're six weeks into it. We got that resume done, we got the LinkedIn profile done, we spent a couple weeks on the behavioral, a couple weeks on the open-ended, and now what we wanna do is we wanna start reaching out to our network. So who is our critical network? We start with our family, our significant other, then we think about our friends, then we think about current colleagues, former colleagues, people we really trust that we could start practicing with. And Again, with this time with the calendar, it's going to be a little different. We might need to be a little bit more flexible with the time that we're dedicating since we quietly quit into building in these practice sessions based on other people's calendars. But you're going to start doing casual reach outs. Maybe you purchase the baseline Calendly package, which is like $15 a month US. And you start looking for times where people will practice with you. You give them the Zoom link, you give them your availability, you give them the practice questions, you may even bribe them with pizza or beer or whatever they like to get them to practice with you. But ideally over the next couple weeks, you get three to four of these sessions a week to practice one-on-one -on -one with another human being. It's gonna be incredibly impactful for your success and most people don't practice so if you could imagine just doing six to eight of these sessions where you've already prepped your examples you've started to work on the open-ended side you'll be so far ahead of the game and now we're a couple months in and again we haven't put a ton of effort in here we've just repurposed our time since we quietly quit then we move into the last step which is kind of this networking and applying so after a couple months and again it could be one month it really depends on how aggressive you want to be we start networking and applying to roles. So how do we network? Networking is my preferred path. So we start by finding second connections on LinkedIn, because if you have a second connection, you can send them a note with the connection request and we give. We say, Sue, I came across your background. It's really impressive. I wanted to share this article on machine learning in cloud that I came across. Hope you have a great day and just send it over to Sue. Now I want you to repeat that multiple times. Ideally, probably while you're going through your practice strategy, you're gonna reach out to about five people a day. So it's 20 a week, 80 a month, and just give, give, give. Don't ask for anything. Trust me, it will come back your way. Now, if you wanna try this strategy and really track it, which is what I recommend, again, I'll give you that resource below. We're gonna have a ton of resources in today's video. If you do wanna apply online, only about 10% of people get jobs by applying, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to change out 
the summary section on your resume. So specifically, all you're gonna do is you're just gonna keep your go-to or shell resume. You'll make a copy of it. You'll say Google customer engineer, and then you'll date it. And then you'll look at the job responsibilities in that job description, and you'll start to put the responsibilities that you have, replace those in your summary section. You wanna be very, very position aligned. Just make sure that you have those responsibilities if you're putting them in your summary section. I know that this is a ton of data and as I was putting this video together, I thought, how do I keep it high level enough to get these you know, core focus areas but also give the audience enough content and so finding the balance today was a little tricky, but I just wanted to throw a bunch of concepts and ideas at you because again, if we're quietly quitting, the reality is, is that maybe we're not super passionate about our job or maybe there's a better job out there. And I wanted to give you a little bit of an organizational strategy of how you could spend that extra time. I hope this helps. Good luck.